Good morning. How are you guys doing this morning? Well, I want to welcome you to Sweetwater Community Church, and if you're watching online, I want to welcome you too. I'm happy to see you guys again, and I want to thank you guys for your love and support and your prayers, and I want to thank you for uh, the team that stepped in while I was out. It's cool to see uh, people stepping up, Danica and Kyler, who led uh, on different weeks, and Cade came up and sang up here, and then the usual crew was up here holding down the fort, and it's just neat to see the family work, and that's one of the beautiful things about this church is that it's a family, and uh, it's just like uh, going to Thanksgiving dinner. If somebody is feeling a little out of it and can't cook their part of the meal, someone else steps up and says, I got you. I'll make the potatoes. So it's nice to see the family step up. Why don't we stand together and let's open our service Sing. Oh, there's Eloise. Hey. I'm not singling you out. If you watch online, you know, sometimes you'll see Pastor Chris single people out. We've been watching online the last couple of weeks. And you're like, who is she talking to? I, I see how the random stuff happens. So let's stand together and let's uh, worship our God. have a seat. Perfect timing. Good morning, everybody. Well, we are going to have a little fun today. Please tell me whether you're watching online or whether you're here in person, did anyone download the app? One, two, three, okay, so then we, you might want to get near those people because maybe they'll want your help, although we're really not supposed to get near. near. So social distance, but bottom line is, is each week we're going to have some fun, we're going to learn some trivia, Christmas trivia, and we're also going to do, um, we're d we got some good games coming up. Uh, family Feud, things like that. It's going to be wonderful, and we just wanted to bring a little joy, and I want to be the first one to say, Merry Christmas! Welcome. Didn't it, doesn't our sanctuary look beautiful? It does. Thank you to everybody, whether you're watching online or here in person, that came and helped uh, decorate. 
it was so beautiful to walk in yesterday or drive into the parking lot and just see a whole row of cars. And that's what church family is all about. So thank you so much for those of you that were able to come and bring a vision to life and have it be Christ honoring, but yet also festive and fun. And that's the balance we want to achieve this Christmas because Christmas is a season of hope, a season of joy, a season of peace and a season of love. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next four weeks. So who is ready to play? I see Carrie's ready, Bernadette and Jeannie. We've got three people. Log in if you are uh, there. Michelle's uh, loading up. Okay, Savannah and Linda are logged on. Anyone else? Uh oh, we have some struggles. All right, we got some more. While we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and take a minute to shamelessly plug um, the women's ministry event that is this weekend. We are having it today. It is not too late to sign up. If you're watching online, you are welcome to call this week and get your name on, but we need it on by no later than Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. That's what the cutoff is going to be because we have sandwiches and stuff to make, and we are so excited about the season. And at the Christmas tea, this book is one, this little treasure was given to me about 20 years ago by a dear friend of mine who we were prayer partners at the time. And it is a book called Cosmic Christmas. And it was written um, in part by Max Lucado. And he, this book is one that I try to read every, it's a short read, you can read it within an hour. But it is a book that just sets up the meaning of Christmas. And it is, it's based on the Bible, but it's a behind the scenes look. It's kind of at the spiritual, the unseen things that we do not see and we know for sure that there is probably some factual basis in this because it talks about how Satan basically did not want Jesus to be born because he knew so these are going to be our giveaways today so um, somebody will get their very own copy and if Maybe we'll do it in first, second, and third, because I have three copies to give away. And also for you women coming, there will be about 15 uh, copies of this available for people uh, that they can win at the women's tea. So come on in, people. Okay, we are going to get ready to go. Let's start. I don't know how this works, so <laughs> oh, here we go. Starts now. How far did Mary and Joseph travel to go from Jerusalem to Bethlehem? 50 miles, 80 miles, 130 miles, or 113 miles? Do, 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 do. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. The correct answer was 130 miles. Woo, we got four people in, four people correct. Okay, next question. Oh, look, it gives you a lot of points. <laughs> I don't know how we all got points. Only four people got it right. <laughs> Maybe it was based on how fast they answered. What, who was the king of Judea when Jesus was born? Nebuchadnezzar, Herod, Solomon, or Julius Caesar? Okay, just sight to be known, it's not Julius Caesar, in case you're wondering. Okay. Ooh, four people got it right. Okay, next question. Ooh, Jess is killing it. Jess, did Jeannie give you the answers ahead of time? <laughs> okay, which of these mean God with us? Yeshua, Jesus, Emmanuel, or Messiah? You can help a friend out. If you know what it is, call it. So you can say it. Who knows what it is? Emmanuel. I believe that is correct. We're going to be talking about him today. Okay, yes, you got to be quick. That's what I'm learning. Even if you get it right, you have to be quick. Why did the man, the wise men not report Jesus to the king? Why, why, why? They were warned by Joseph. There was a flood. They were warned in a dream. Their camel broke down. I think it's number four. Their camel broke down. Oh, they were warned in a dream. That's right. 
I don't know, Jess, you're getting somebody's real close behind you now. Who told Joseph and Mary to flee to Egypt? An angel, the king, the donkey, or the wise men? Was this the, the talking donkey, Balaam? 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 Whatever that donkey's name was. Okay. An angel. I think you might be right. An angel. Ooh, Walt moved in front. <laughs> okay. Who did Herod execute when he learned about Jesus? Oh, this is a sad one. That's not very happy. Um, all newborn babies, all children in Bethlehem, everyone in Bethlehem, or all children under two years. Okay, if you haven't answered, the common theme seems to be green. Green it is. Ooh, Harry. <laughs> okay, we're going to do three more questions. So we're going to go to number 10. And then we'll have some more for next week. What did Mary and Joseph sacrifice after Jesus' birth? Two doves. Two turtle doves. Thank you. <laughs> a lamb, a calf, and a chicken. Better not have been my chickens. Two doves. Ooh. He was the lamb of God, though. I could see why you would put that. Okay, next question. You guys have three left. Angels told which of these about Jesus' birth? The shepherds, the wise men, King Herod, or the people of Bethlehem? Who's fast? Who's fast? Shepherds. Let's see. We'll probably give you less time next week, just an FYI. Shepherds. The people of Bethlehem, by the way, I actually almost think that could have been a correct answer. Because they were right outside, you know they had to have seen. Jesus was a descendant of Ahab, Joseph, David, and John the Baptist. Oh, this one is a little tricky. I could argue for another one besides the correct answer. David. But since we know that in old times the he was an adopted he was adopted into Joseph. So technically he was part of Joseph's family as well. So I almost think that one should have been a technicality. What gifts did the wise men bring baby Jesus? Gold, olive branches, and frankincense, myrtle, cinnamon, and cypress? Isn't that a tree? Um, Jewels, gold, and spices, and the yellow is gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Yellow is correct. Okay, was that number 10, or are we on number 10? Wow. Okay, one more. This is it. This is for the win. <laughs> Why was baby Jesus fed in the manger? They had no relatives in Bethlehem. The inn had no vacancy. They were hiding from King Herod, or the angel told them to go there. Bum, 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 it's like watching bum, NASCAR, bum, watching guys bum, pass each other in the lead. This bum, is awesome. Bum, bum, Coming bum, on the inside, bum, and Walt makes a move. I know. It's like on Jeopardy, where they just push the button and try to guess <laughs> the right answer. Okay, let's see the final tally. Ooh, oh. Walt is the big winner. Where's Walt? Oh, he's right in front of me. Okay, Walt, you are the winner. Harry, you are second. Whoops, there's book. And we have a new family that finally came. Woohoo! <laughs> so you guys get a gift. <laughs> okay, one last thing. So, was that fun? Did you guys have fun? All right, it's going to get funner, let me tell you. So next week, everybody needs to have this loaded on their phone. If you can't get it loaded on your phone next, or if you don't understand how, call the church office, and not me, but Bernadette will be happy to assist you. So uh, we want everyone to be able to participate next week. Some weeks may involve some things being thrown into the audience, so make sure you have your glasses on so you can see something coming flying towards you. So we are going to slow down the service now, and we're going to spend a few minutes um, 
talking uh, really the beginning of the sermon today. We are in the season of Advent. If you grew up in a high church, liturgical church, whether it's a Catholic church or an Episcopalian, Lutheran, anything like that, then Advent candles would be very familiar to you because that's a tradition that started in the Catholic church. And what it was was there's seasons in the church. And it was the season before. Advent literally means um, to prepare for the coming one. So it's to prayer, the idea of preparation. And during this season, the candles were meant to be a symbol. They were, one was lit each week. Some families make their own Advent candle and they do it at home. Each of the candles has meaning. This week we're going to light um, the purple candle here. And the purple candle this week stands for hope. And it's also known by some as the, the prophecy candle. Because the idea of, we're going to be talking about this in just a little bit, is the idea, though, of is hope is a belief in that the prophecies are going to come true. And so this season is a time not only to prepare for the coming of Jesus and his birth and what a happy event that is, but it's happy because we talked about this a few weeks ago. It's the idea that in the end, Jesus wins. Right? It's not just about his first coming, it's about his second coming. And it's what gives us hope in this season, in this world that we live in right now. And so the songs that we're going to be singing today come out of scripture. And they're the idea of Emmanuel, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And this song was written hundreds of years ago and it was one that was used within the church and it was a pleading and it was always started off on this Sunday and it was a pleading of O oh, come, O oh, come, Emmanuel, you are the promised one, you are the hope. And so I'm going to read some scriptures and then we're going to get ready uh, to just breathe these words in and take some time to slow down, to breathe and just reflect on who God is and who he is in our lives. It's about bringing an intentionality into our Christmas season. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and peace shall know no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Therefore, Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And the sign is about the coming Messiah. And it says, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely exile here, until the Son of God.
Thou long expected Jesus, born to set Thy people free from our fears and sins. Release us, let us find our rest in Thee. Israel, strength. Good morning. <laughs> so um, we are going to do the poinsettia project again, and this is something that is really near and dear to Bob and I's heart. Um, as many of you know, we were both widowed before we met each other, and neither of our spouses is buried here in San Diego. So having the opportunity to bring a poinsettia in their loving memory at Christmas time is a way that we can honor them since we we don't have a grave site to go visit. So um, I invite all, any of you who would like to bring a poinsettia. It can be in memory of, it can be in honor of, it can be in joy of. Um, you'll um, and bring them starting anytime now. Um, you can bring them to the office and uh, Bernadette and I will babysit them. <laughs> I'll help her water them. <laughs> You'll fill out a little card that will say who you are and what you are bring up, bringing a poinsettia for. And we want 
everyone to have an opportunity to do this. So if you, um, you out there that are watching online, if you need help getting out to get one, I will be happy to pick them up for you. Anyone that feels like that just won't fit in their budget this year, please don't worry. We're going to get extra poinsettias, and we would love to put your name on one of them. So I will have Bernadette um, hand out my phone number so that um, you can call me, and I will um, shop for you or provide a poinsettia for you. And Becky has a wonderful display all, all, all planned, and we're just going to increase the beauty up here. So now I'd like to um, give the, the blessing for our tithes and offerings. Um, so if you'll pray with me. Um, Heavenly Father, we uh, bring our offerings to you today with joy in our hearts knowing that no matter how great or small our offering, it is there to do your work in our church, in our community, in our country, and in our world. We thank you. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your faith. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride, We'll be church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. be justice, all will be new, your name forever, faithful and true, Jesus is coming soon, like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be church ready for Yeah. 
your breathing. I'm stuck. Great. This is how I'm going to preach today. <laughs> okay, Kathy, you want to help a girl out? <laughs> it's literally stuck. <laughs> I'm being COVID compliant, except not right this second. <laughs> Breathe this way. I don't know how I got it up again. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. A few costume malfunctions, the joys of COVID, right? Oh, my goodness. Well, I hope you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving. Yay, if you did. Yay. Yay. Um, we had um, my kids over and their families, and you know how every holiday either something funny happens that will make it memorable, and sometimes it's things not so funny that make it memorable? Well, in our case, we averted a tragedy, and um, we also learned um, that we laughed about it a lot afterwards, and we also learned who the calm people are in our family and who are the fight and the flight. So it was about an hour before dinner, and um, every year I make this, these yeast rolls that they have to rise, and they weren't rising because it was kind of a cool day on um, on Thursday, at least up in Crest it was, and so we had opened windows to, you know, air out the house and be really safe, and so I had stuck the rolls in the oven, and I, I always cover them because you don't want the draft, so I covered them with a um, couple towels, and maybe some of you are guessing where this is going, and so they were in there happily rising and doing their thing, and just those little air bubbles, the yeast, just they were just smelling fragrant and beautiful as they rose. And unbeknownst to all of us, and my daughter-in-law, by the way, this is the stove. The oven's underneath the stove. My daughter-in-law is standing here, just stirring. You may have seen her. She's been here before. She brings my dad when he's able to come. She's happily stirring her gravy. My son comes over, unbeknownst to anyone, including her, and pops on the oven to 375. We're all happily sitting, spaced out. A couple of my kids were behind me in the dining room. Some were in the, the living room. Some were out on the deck. And next thing you know, my daughter, who's on the other side, she's my flight girl, she starts backing up. And she's like, does anyone else smell that? Because I'm kind of seeing smoke and smelling smoke. And we're like, what could it be? And so my daughter, my, my son goes, well, what would it be? And my daughter-in-law, still stirring the gravy, calmly reaches down and opens the oven, and whoop, out come flames. <laughs> and, and everybody was calm. My husband was down the hall. He heard the ruckus. He knew he didn't need to come. He figured it was under control. And um, so we're sitting there, and I go rushing towards the stove and thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And my son goes, who put the stuff in the oven? And Stephanie's calmly stirring the gravy. <laughs> she goes, your mom did. Why didn't she tell us you were going to turn it on? And she's just literally stirring gravy. Everybody else is like, oh, this guy is falling. And, and so my son finally like, or no, she reached in actually. She grabbed a potholder. She reached in and she whipped off the towel that was now flaming. And then she just flings it into the sink. I go over, shut the water off. And by now the house is, oh, it smelled awful. There's smoke everywhere. And my daughter-in-law goes back over and calmly stirs the gravy. So I just want you to know we averted a family, a fire. My daughter-in-law is the one you want over. She's in control. And by the way, she makes killer gravy. So we were super excited about that gravy because the gravy did not burn and the rolls, she whipped it off just in time that the rolls did not get ruined. So anyway, that's my, that's my Thanksgiving story and it truly happened and it happened pretty much just like that. But it was funny because people just backed up. <laughs> so we, we learned who the fight or flight people were and, and who the calm, calm one was. So the next time you're like facing a tragedy, just channel your inner, my inner daughter-in-law and just calmly stir and just give instructions. <laughs> it works. Staying calm actually works. So today we are going to be talking, as I said, about our first candle, which is the candle of hope or also known in some churches as the candle of prophecy. And we sang about Emmanuel and we talked about it. And there's two words that, that strike me. It's the candle of hope and it's the candle of prophecy. And prophecy, the biblical definition of prophecy is a foretelling or a prediction of what is to come. 
It is something that is declared by a prophet, especially a divinely inspired prophet. And then you have hope. Biblical hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised, and, it, and its strength is in his faithfulness. So here the first week is about prophecy and hope. The idea that what God foretold in the Old Testament is true. The idea that what God said is going to happen. And it comes down to hope. And it's that confident expectation. Not a pansy, wimpy, oh, I hope so. You know, it's not Eeyore hope. It is I serve a mighty God. And no matter what's, my, my, the mightiness and the strength of my God are not dependent on my circumstances around me. It doesn't matter that COVID-19 has happened. Did it change our holidays a little? Yes. Were we eating in the dark at 530 outside on my back patio? Yes. It changed some things. It meant my, that some of our loved ones couldn't be with us because we had to respect where they were and make sure that they were safe. But you know what? No matter our circumstances, Jesus is the same. Our God is the same. And that's the hope that we talk about today. That's the hope that this candle represents. It's the hope because it doesn't matter. Christmas is still going to happen this year. You know, it's the, remember the Grinch who stole Christmas? You know, I love the cartoon version. My grandson loves the Jim Carrey version, and I like them both. But I'm a traditionalist. I grew up with the cartoon version and, you know, all the little Who's and Whoville down there singing around that tree at the end. And, and it's just that beautiful moment where even though he wasn't talking about that, the truth is, as he said, Christmas isn't wrapped up in presents. It's not about that. Christmas is about the ultimate gift, which is the gift of the manger, right? So that's what this Christmas season is about. And so the one thing we know, though, is that Scripture talks. It prophesies. And like I said, this is a season of preparation. That's what Advent is. We are preparing for the coming Christ. We're preparing for the birth of this beautiful baby. How many of you have either had children yourself or, or you, you know somebody that, you know, maybe it's a niece or a nephew or a good friend of yours that, you know, is pregnant? And what do you do for those nine months? You start dreaming. You start dreaming about that little baby. My, my daughter loves her, her niece. And when she found out that my, um, that her, my sister or my, her sister-in-law was pregnant with the, you know, the baby. She was just like, she was beyond. She started buying presents. And, and she helped plan her shower because we were expectantly waiting. And we had the, the gender reveal at our house. And we just did all this fun stuff in preparation of. And pretty much anyone that asked me, I'd be like, guess what? I'm going to be a grandma. I'm going to be a grandma. Guess what? I mean, people like would bring up baby and I would somehow manage to weave into it. My, my grandchild being born as if somehow my grandchild and my grandson were the most special in the world. Now, I would tell you they are, but every person says that, right? Because there, there, there are nieces and nephews. There are precious children. Maybe it's a child you work with in your elementary school. Maybe you're a preschool teacher and you just have that one kid that just grabs your heart. And they're special to you, and you want to protect them, and you also want to champion them and proclaim them, right? Like, you know, did you see what they did? Aren't they the most intelligent kid? They spit today. They, they were wonderful, you know? They, they, they kicked Johnny, but, oh, they kicked him so cutely. Come on, that's my baby. Look at how cute that was when he punched him upside the head. Or like the time that my daughter in front of my father-in-law and his wife, we were outside of a thing, and I didn't think it was cute at the time, but now I actually have to admit, I think it was kind of funny. Um, we were outside of a restaurant, and she was kind of perturbed, and she was a spicy little thing, my daughter was. And she turned around, and the next thing we knew, her brother was flying into the bushes because she slugged him. He bugged her. <laughs> And, and that was one of those moments as a parent where you're not quite so proud. You're not sure if you want to proclaim it. But that moment lives in infamy now in our family. And, and I will tell you, my, my middle son learned not to push around his little sister. So that was kind of a 
good and bad moment. But all of everything we do this season is about preparing the way. Isaiah 40, point, uh, 40 verse, uh, chapter 40, verse 3 said, A voice is calling, clear the way for the Lord. Clear the way for the Lord in the wilderness. Make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Malachi 3, 1, the prophet says, Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord, Adonai, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. He will prepare the way of the Lord. That was referencing John the Baptist. I never understood why John the Baptist was part of the Christmas story, right? It's kind of like, oh, I think John, I think Luke, when he wrote that in chapter one, was just maybe, you know, in my mind, it was like, oh, he's just going in chronological order. But when you tie it all in with Advent, you realize they're on to something here. Everything that's in the Bible is intentional. God puts it in there for a reason. So why that? Why? Because it's prophecy. It said that he would prepare the way for the Lord. Someone was going to come who would be that voice in the wilderness, that one calling out and saying, listen. He's coming, and he's coming soon. How many of us hear those voices? We hear those warning signs. We hear this, we've got great news. Come, listen, listen, listen. And we ignore, ignore, ignore. That's what John the Baptist was. He was the one crying out in the wilderness. He wasn't out there. He was out there eating locusts. He was kind of a strange dude. Maybe that's why people didn't want to come around him. I don't know. But the bottom line is, he was the prophesied one. He was preparing the way. In Wesleyan theology, we're going to tangent off just slightly. There is a phrase that we use that is called prevenient grace. And it is the most beautiful thing in our theology. The idea is that we all sin. We all fall, fall short of the glory of God. And in the word says that none can come to God without their heart being softened. It can't happen on its own because our heart, remember we talked about that mirror a long time ago and how it was pure. Our hearts were pure reflections with Adam and Eve until they sinned, right? And then when they sinned, it was like someone took mud and put it all over it and it prevented that reflection of God. It prevented God from entering our hearts again. So prevenient grace is the idea. It's called the grace that comes before that in order to know who Jesus is, in order to be able to understand what he says to us and, and receive him into our heart as our Lord and Savior, there's a grace that comes from the Holy Spirit that comes into our life and it softens and it prepares our hearts for the message of God. That's what John the Baptist was. He was a form of prevenient grace, the grace that comes before he was there to cry it out, and he didn't care. He was the kind of man that lived his own life. It says that he lived in the desert. He really did eat locusts. It says he wore, like, coarse material. So I would imagine it was some kind of burlapy. That's just what I'm imagining. I don't know what he wore. But he was that person that just lived his life and was bold enough and brave enough and sold out for God enough that he just said, he's coming, he's coming soon. And we read prophecy from Isaiah that said, first there was going to come the one, and he was going to cry out. And then, then the coming Messiah would come. He and Jesus were less than a year apart. His Jesus' mother Mary and John's mother Elizabeth, they were cousins. And it says that when um, Mary found out she was pregnant, we'll talk about this more in a couple weeks, that when she found out she was pregnant and she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth, that it says that John le leapt within Elizabeth's womb. So supernaturally, the grace was already working both in Mary's life and in John the Baptist's life. So is John the Baptist important? You bet he is. You 
that he is. And we have the opportunity this Christmas season to be a John the Baptist. We have the opportunity to spread joy and to remind people of the real reason for this season. We have the opportunity to tell people that it's that I love Christmas stuff as much as anyone else. You come to my house, it's going to be full on decked out in Christmas. My husband is incredible. He puts lights all over the place. I love the bells and the whistles of Christmas. But I don't ever want that to get lost in what the true meaning is. The true meaning is that he's the voice in the wilderness calling out to Christ, the Christ child, the, the promised Messiah that they had been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. And the Christ child was going to come. And people needed to listen. And then when he was here, people didn't, still didn't believe. And that was John the Baptist. That was the importance of him. Because he was the one that as Jesus grew, so did John the Baptist. And he let people know. His dad and mom, Zechariah was his dad. He was a, a Levite priest. And mom was Elizabeth, as I already said. And Zechariah, they used to rotate, the priests did. They would rotate throughout the month, throughout the year. And they would go in and they would take care of the incense to keep the incense burning. And it was, it was in the inner chamber of the temple, the synagogue, so to speak. And he would go in there. And so this, uh, this time he went in there and he was praying. And we don't know what he was saying. It doesn't say what Zachariah's prayer was. We don't know, but we do know this. Scripture says that Zachariah and his wife were like Abraham and Sarah. They were old. They were old. They were more than likely between anywhere between 50 and 70 to 80 years old. And they were childless. They did not have children. And back then, when a woman couldn't have a baby, it was considered a sign of shame. It was considered a sign that somehow they weren't blessed. If you couldn't have a baby, you weren't blessed. And we know that, um, we know there's, uh, nowadays with modern technology, we know that it has nothing to do with that. But back then, culturally, in their context, that's what it was. And so here they had been living for, you know, decades as a married couple without a baby. And it says that Zechariah, the dad, was in this temple, and he was there, and it says that, um, uh, a great that he was in there so long and it says while the incense was being burned a great crowd stood outside praying and waiting and it says that an angel of the lord in luke 2 11 said uh, appeared to him standing to the right of the incense altar and he said don't be afraid zechariah god has heard your prayer your wife elizabeth will give you a son and you are to name him john you will have great joy at his birth, and you will have great gladness and, ma gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. And he will turn many Israelites, this is a key, your son, John, will, will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. It says he must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, and here's another one, even before his birth. The provenient grace. He already was filled with the Holy Spirit, and which is why baby John, when he was in his mama's womb, could recognize the divinity of Christ. What a confirmation that must have been to Mary. Think about that. To know, because Elizabeth even said, my baby leapt for joy. How awesome is that? God is so good. He's in even the smallest, most minutest details. He goes on. He doesn't believe God. He's like, eh, how could that be? My wife's old, kind of like reminiscent of Abraham and Sarah, right? Like, how could I be having, you know, no way. This isn't going to happen. And basically, God's like, oh, no, it's going to happen. And now because of your unbelief right in this moment, we're going to go ahead and strike you mute. So he comes out of the temple. The crowd's been waiting because he's been in there. They've been praying because they know the incense is going to be lit. And he comes out, and the crowd's there. And... And it says he had to gesture because he couldn't talk. He goes home. He has to gesture everything because he couldn't talk. The day comes when Elizabeth's baby, it's the time for him to be born. It says in verse 57, she gave birth to a son. And when the neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had been merciful to her, everyone rejoiced. 
he did the circumcision, and it's then that they were going to name him, and it was customary. You would name him after the father. But Zechariah had been told what? No, to name him John. And Elizabeth said, no, his name is John. What, they exclaimed? There's no one in your family with that name. And Zechariah still couldn't talk. So he asked for a tablet, and he ended up writing it down and basically holding up a tablet that said, his name is John. And immediately upon doing that, number one, Zechariah could talk. And the first words out of Zechariah's mouth after he said what his name was, it said he began praising God. Zechariah was so over, just overflowing with thankfulness. And it says that upon hearing and seeing Zechariah, the crowd that had gathered around to celebrate the circumcision, to celebrate this family moment, that they were rejoicing with him. And they said, what will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord is surely upon him in a special way. Zechariah goes on then. It says his father was filled with the Holy Spirit and he gave this prophecy. And he goes on to say, praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and is redeeming his people. He has sent us a mighty savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised. And he was talking about Jesus. And he says, and you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the most high because you will prepare the way for the Lord. Prophecy being fulfilled in this moment. You will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell people how to find his salvation through forgiveness of their sins. And because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. To give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. And to guide us to the path of peace. And it says John grew up and became strong in spirit. And he lived in the wilderness until he began his public ministry to Israel. So today I ask you two questions. What are you doing to prepare the way in your own heart and in the hearts of those around you? And then my second question is, what are you doing to be that voice that cries out in the wilderness? See, this week is about preparation, preparing our hearts. And this week is also about being that voice that spreads the truth of the Christmas season. So what are you doing about those two things? What is a habit that you can build into this Christmas season? For some of you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to look different for every one of you. Some of you, that habit is going to be, maybe you're going to pick one scripture that connects with the candle we're talking about. Maybe you're going to light a candle once a week and have a dinner together with your family and talk about what the candle of hope, the candle of prophecy means. Maybe you're going to say, I'm going to write down Isaiah 43, or I'm going to write down um, Isaiah chapter um, 9, and his name shall be called. And you write down and you just focus on a man, you know, a uh, counselor, wonderful counselor, mighty God. And maybe you just take a couple minutes. I'm not saying that you need to spend hours upon this. Because what I've learned in my own life is if I tell myself, okay, this is the week I'm going to read 15 chapters a day, I'm going to do a theological exegesis of so and so and so, for me, that's automatic failure. I know that scripture says to wake up in the morning and the first thing you do is pop open your Bible and it says, you know, to meditate upon God's word and that we should give thanks. I do believe I give thanks, but I'm telling you, I don't function well when I first wake up in the morning and I, I will not even remember what I've done. So I've learned not to put myself in a box or put other people in a box. We all need to connect with God on a daily basis. Absolutely we do. But for me, it's my drive time to work now. I have my Bible. I have it um, on my phone. I plug in my phone when I'm coming down. I now have a half hour every day, and that's where I get my quiet time with God. So just know it's not about a perfect formula. It's about a perfect formula for you. And some of you, those whether you're watching here or in, in here in person, some of you, it's just about one scripture. 
And maybe you write it down. Maybe you put it in your car and tape it on your um, dashboard so that throughout the day, every time you get in the car, maybe you're, you're at home working from home and you're teaching kids or you're, you're just doing whatever it is that you do online now to work. Maybe you're just going to have a little thing and you're just going to put that card there. Maybe you're going to just write down what is the definition of hope or what is the biblical definition of prophecy so that when you're struggling on that day and you're thinking, I hate COVID, I'm done with this, I'm over all of this, you can just focus on that. That God's word is real. It is trustworthy. And the prophecies of the Old Testament are coming true. And just as they were coming true then, as we sang today, not only in O Come, O Come, but in Come Thou Fount, all of those, those are prophecies. Remember we talked about joy to the world and that it's actually not a Christmas song. It, we, we've made it a Christmas song, our our culture has but it's what it's actually a song about what joy to the world the lord has come why not just as a baby in the manger but it was talking about the second coming of christ but it, it heralds both but it was about the second coming of christ so i my prayer for you this christmas season is that you can grasp hold of the here and the now Stop beating yourself up for what you are or are not doing. Find grace for the people around you. Be the Stephanie stirring the pot. Model Jesus in the chaos around you. That's what Advent is about. It is about preparing our hearts so that we can share Christ with others. Amen? Amen. So my prayer for you, and I'm going to pray it now, is Jesus, right now, I just pray that you just help each and every person, whether they're sitting here or watching from home, God, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you would help them to build one thing, whether it's into their family, whether it's into the, themselves, but just some habit once a week. Maybe it's Sunday evenings. I don't know, God. I don't know what works best for their lives and their families, but I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would take the busyness and the chaos that sometimes this season can be. Unpack it all. Get away from what the world says and just focus. Have that one opportunity once a week to focus on who you are, Christ. The gift of the Savior. We thank you for people like John the Baptist who literally were born to prepare the way for that provenient grace where they were able to come in and it allows us to know God in a, in a new way and a fresh way and a deeper way for the very first time. So we just thank you for that, Lord. And we just take all these things and we just pray for an incredible Christmas season. And it doesn't matter what's going to happen in the world around us because... Jesus was still born, and he's still coming again, and Christmas Day is still going to happen. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Don't forget the candle of hope. Light one at home. I haven't volunteered yet. I was supposed to do this. I forgot. Um, we still could use some, like how I didn't fling the gift out today, but a few small gifts, some things for the coffee cart outside. We also need people to come in and help light uh, or to put together all the candles for Christmas Eve service. And then also, if you know of anyone this Wednesday night at 6 p.m., if you are a child or you want to, um, if you're watching online with moms and dads, um, we're going to be doing a COVID safe uh, small Christmas performance with kids on the fourth Sunday of Advent. So I think it's the 20th if I, my memory calls. But on Wednesday night, starting this Wednesday, we are going to start practicing. Um, any age is welcome in terms of the kids performing. Um, if you love to sing, come. And we're going to do some fun stuff with that. And if you know of anyone, sorry about that. If you know of anyone that um, you think would enjoy it, invite them to, to come, and we're going to have fun. So 6 o'clock this Wednesday night. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.